In this video, we're going to examine the effects of privatization from many different perspectives. The results are taken from a subsample of 170 privatized firms from 1983 to 1992. And when we talk about before privatization, we will look at the average value in the four years leading up to the reform. After privatization values are taken from 1993. In addition, we'll also look at some of the problems of privatization, as well as the Mexican economy in 2012. Let's look first at the effect of privatization on labor. 4.4% of the workforce was employed in state-owned enterprises in 1982. With privatization, this decreased to 2% a decade later. Most of this reduction came in the railroad sector, where the number of workers fell from 46,000 to 23,000 after it was privatized. In general, the average number of workers at the newly privatized firms fell by about 65%. This was split relatively evenly between blue-collar and white-collar workers. It's estimated that 30% of the improved productivity of the newly privatized firms came from the layoffs. A lot of the increased unemployment after privatization was due to industry-specific factors, and not just to privatization. When researchers control for this, they find that only about 35% of the new unemployment was specifically due to privatization. So what happened to these laid-off workers? Mexican academics Lopez Calva and Rosa Yon followed the experience of laid-off workers for a year and found that about 50% of these workers found jobs in the same sector in that time period. Given this, it seems that only about 5% of the laid-off workers were still unemployed a year later. And some of those workers may have entered the informal sector or gone into business for themselves. Given that these sectors grew from 49% of the workforce in 1980 to 60% in 1996, this seems like a plausible assumption. But what about the workers that remained? The rising productivity of privatized firms translated into higher wage rates as well, especially in blue-collar jobs. Wages in those positions increased by about 122% as compared to 77% for white-collar workers. It should be noted that these wage increases took place in a period where overall wages were stagnant. Workers who were laid off from state-owned enterprises typically found work at lower wages, but tended to put in longer hours to make up the difference. What kind of effect did privatization have on prices? Well, one reason that the public may have been disillusioned with privatization is that it often seemed to coincide with higher prices, in part because reform didn't increase competitiveness in many sectors, as well as for the fact that the government was no longer subsidizing prices. So let's take telecommunications as a case study, where the effect on prices was mixed. The price of local calls increased by almost 50% in the 1990s, while the price of long-distance calls fell by more than 20% after 1995. On the other hand, access to telephone services increased greatly. The wait time to get a landline fell from 2.5 years in 1990 to 30 days in 97. Another example is water, where prices increased 9% in privatized areas relative to non-privatized ones. Despite criticism of privatization's effect on prices, researchers have found little evidence of it in practice. The average prices of the products of privatized firms went up by 1.3% after the reform. Researchers have found that firms were significantly more profitable after privatization. On average, the operating income to sales ratio increased by 24 percentage points, while the net income to sales ratio increased by almost 40 percentage points. At the time of privatization, state-owned enterprises were obviously much less profitable than private firms. After privatization, these firms consistently gained ground on private companies and eventually became more profitable on average. In terms of net incomes to sales, the enterprises targeted for privatization were 17 percentage points less profitable than private companies before reform. Afterward, they were 4 percentage points more profitable. It's noteworthy that these firms increased their sales despite the fact that they had fewer employees and that there was little new investment. Increased prices only explain about 5% of the increased ratio of operating income to sales, meaning that higher prices aren't the explanation behind the higher profitability. It also doesn't seem to be caused by increasing market power. The authors study where the uncompetitive sectors became more profitable after privatization, and they found no significant difference between them and competitive ones. The fiscal impact of privatization was relatively large. Total privatization revenues from 1983 to 2003 totaled more than 5% of 2003 GDP, and almost 80% of those revenues were from the Salinas years. The government used these revenues for three main purposes. One, as a rainy day fund to protect against random external shocks. Two, to pay back external debt. 
Total debt, including both domestic and external debt, fell from more than 80% of GDP in 1986 to 27% in 2001. And third, to permanently increase spending on education and social welfare. There are some well-documented failures of privatization as well, including road construction and banking. Here we'll talk a little bit about banking. During their nationalized phase, banks were at the beck and call of the Treasury Department and mostly functioned as an ATM for the government and the politically connected elite. Loan officers had very few skills in terms of evaluating credit risks or collateral that they would need after privatization. Privatization took place with weak institutions to enforce contract rights. It also took place without institutions that encouraged prudent behavior by bankers. Stephen Haber argues that banks were sold at very high prices, and in return, the new owners expected weak regulation and oversight, as well as little competition. In fact, the buyers of these banks were allowed to use borrowed, mo borrowed money to complete their purchase. In a couple of cases, the purchasers actually borrowed money from the very same banks that they were bidding on. The result was reckless behavior by banks and a collapse of the banking system. It produced a banking system that became insolvent within four years and had to be bailed out at a cost estimated at $65 billion. In a 2012 survey of Mexico, the British periodical The Economist noted that economic competitiveness was still hurt by monopolies in key sectors. Let's take the example of telecommunications again. The Economist notes a fast broadband connection in Mexico costs nearly twice as much as in Chile. It doesn't help that telecommunications are a near monopoly. Carlos Slim, the world's richest man, controls companies that account for about 80% of fixed phone lines, 75% of broadband connections, and 70% of mobiles. The Economist goes on to note that, quote, nearly all of Mexico's bread comes from the company Bimbo, all of its cement comes from Cemex, and television from Televisa, and that nearly a third of household spending in Mexico is on products with monopoly or tight oligopoly suppliers. So it's clear that while privatization was successful in many dimensions, much of the private economy remains monopolistic. Increased competition could raise overall efficiency and significantly raise Mexico's growth rate. Alberto Chong and Florencio Lopez de Solanas have a couple of really great articles looking at the results of privatization in Latin America and Mexico specifically. Here are two of them that I would recommend. For more information on privatization results in Mexico and in Latin America, I would also recommend La Rafael Laporta and Florencio Lopez de Solanes, The Benefits of Privatization, Evidence from Mexico, and David McKenzie and Dilip Mukherjee's The Distributive Impact of Privatization in Latin America, Evidence from Four Countries. Two papers that I specifically referenced in the video are Stephen Haber's Mexico's Experiments with Bank Privatization and Liberalization, published in Journal of Banking and Finance in 2005, as well as Luis Felipe Lopez Calva and Juan Rosellon's paper, on privatization and inequality, the Mexican case. And lastly, for a great survey of the Mexican economy in 2012, look at the Economist November 24th issue.